My next speaker is, uh, when you heard the phrase, pillar of the breed, and she easily qualifies for this. She's bred since 1951, some of the outstanding collies in the country. The name Wickmere is one of the standbys of anybody's breeding program. She is a she has bred a best in show winner. She has bred the CCFA 1972 winner. That was our chimney sweep that you've heard about. She is an author of the best selling book, Collie Concept has written innumerable articles in books, magazines, memos, pamphlets, what have you, helping to, with that favorite phrase of mine, bettering the breed. And she spoke in symposiums from Anchorage to Miami and from Los Angeles for a little village called Nashua, New Hampshire. She's been up here four different times on different speaking of things. Will you give a warm, wonderful Collie College welcome to one of my favorites, Bobby Roos. The topic is skullduggery, but we're going to cover two S's, skullduggery and surviving or being a survivor. Sometimes you just don't know what to expect in this hobby and what you can do with it. And it's like the little fellow in England that was delivering a telegram out of, out of the village. He got out there and he leaned his bicycle up against the hedgerow, went up and took the big brass knocker, knocked at the door, and Mrs. Wiggins said, who is it? And he said, Ms. Wiggins, I've got a telegram for you. She said, oh, Lord, I've always wanted a singing telegram. And he said, but I'm sorry, ma'am. He said, it ain't a singing telegram. It's just a regular one. She said, oh, I was so hoping that someday someone would send me a singing telegram. And he said, all right. Bum, 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 bum. Your sister Rose is dead. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start out in this hobby, and you might have the best of intentions, and goals, and dreams, you never know what's going to come along, because you're going to have to be a survivor. When Dr. Girth called 10 days before she succumbed to cancer, she asked uh, if I would take over her skull collection to go out and continue her education on what was under all this tissue and muscle. Dot's call, we paid, placed in our memory bank of highlights, the comments made to us by Alva Rosenberg, Ed Pickhart, Steve Fields, which even included a written note from him, <laughs> Isabel Butler's encouragement, and Florence Cummings' advice. Praise from peers is a soothing balm to the scars and incidents a breeder confronts. You have to be a survivor to outlast the curves that Mother Nature throws you. At an Atlanta seminar years ago, Dot Girth and I were on the same panel. During a question and answer period, Dot was asked what was the biggest disappointment to her uh, as a participant in breeding and showing collies. Her reply was that when she learned that her stock had PRA and she had to start all over again, and she got rid of all those dogs. And I came across a German proverb that reads, Alle Kunst ist umsonst mein in Engel auf das Zumach Brunst. Translated, it says, All skill is in vain if an angel pisses in the flintlock of your musket. <laughs> survivors, and through her durability and quest for knowledge, we have her coat color genetics research, a photographic history of establishing a line, and her skull collection. 
You anchor endurance on friendship, and those are especially valuable when they have experience. When the DC-10 somersaulted in a fireball on the runway in Sioux City, Iowa in July, the pilot, Captain Alfred Haynes, was asked how he felt at this time. And he said, everybody kicked in, offered their own assistance without being told. We have a lot of experience there, and it showed up in the cockpit. There is no substitute for experience. Also, there's the story of Flight 232 in February, when Captain David Cronin smoothly landed a Jumbo 747 in Honolulu after a cargo door and part of the fuselage blew off, sucking out nine passengers and dumping them into the ocean. These accidents point out a pilot issue in the aviation industry, the shrinking pool of qualified pilots. We have a shrinking pool of teaching peers from whom we can tap the reservoir of experience. When we purchased our foundation bitch in 1953 from the Kinmont Kennels, then located in Washington State, Isabel Butler suggested I write Florence Cummings to advise her that we had Kinmont Kachina by international champion Kinmont Shane out of Florence's Star of Arrowhead. That would be that um, uh, Kachina and her Arrow Hill Ace High, who was one of the top producers in his, in his time, were half-brother and half-sister. I wrote to Florence and told her who we had. I did not expect a reply, but received a lengthy, gracious, welcoming letter to this novice in the Southwest. And in her letter, she stated that Ace High was a carrier of the semi-lethal gray gene. The information was given as a simple, straightforward statement of fact. Perhaps she was preparing the Roos family for our best lesson of an experienced from an uh, best lesson from an experienced peer, and perhaps warning us of the angel and the footlock and our musket. I thought this German proverb so apropos to the dog hobby that I tucked it into our grooming kit and took it to a specialty show in 1978. It made a tour of the grooming area down in our part of the building, and we all shared it, and we all found the humor in it. About five days later, I had a call from the president of the Collie Club of America, and she said, Bobby, what is this petition you're handing out to rescind the win of the, of the CCMA Best of Breed winner? And I said, what petition? And it was the uh, little German proverb that I'd been handing out. And this reminds me of the English rhyme. When I sat next to the Duchess at tea, it was just as I thought it would be. Her rumblings at Donald were simply phenomenal, and someone thought it was me. <laughs> I thought this was a, a ludicrous assumption and rather humorous until the story reverberated from coast to coast and north to Canada. Rumor mongers are satisfied to create a situation which will discredit an individual or disparage a dog. At the conclusion of judging a specialty some years ago, I asked the handler during the photo session who my best of breed was. This is Champion Lickreed's drummer boy. And I took a closer look. Why, well, his eye wasn't as big and round or light as I had heard over and over again. Then there was another dog, Mrs. Long's champion Miranda Daly Double, who won the 1968 CCFA. And he too did not have an eye as big and round and bold as everyone said. Both of these dogs had excellent virtues and attributes which the collie breed needed at that time and I think it kind of recrudesces and we need it occasionally. Then there are the blab scans concerning hip dysplasia and PRA that does not even exist in the individual dogs or the related dogs in a kennel. And there appears to be a double standard. One lovely dog was literally crucified because a breeder had a litter in which a skin problem erupted. I surely empathize with the dog's owner, a dedicated, conscientious individual, 
with several generations of superb specimens. The negative blitzkrieg against this fine dog was an emotional blow to that honor. During my travels, I saw several of his offspring and was so favorably impressed that I inquired about using that dog at stud. I would term this risk benefit. We have kept many litters, entire litters, to the age of 18 months and older. When I made my serious inquiry, I learned that the dog had been so stigmatized that he was neutered and placed in a pet home. At the time this dog was being boycotted, another stud, appearing on a magazine cover, exhibited and advertised extensively, was siring litters nationwide with the identical skin problems. And they were appearing in a number of litters. Double standard. Al Capone said, when I sell liquor, it's called bootlegging. When my patrons serve it on a silver tray on Lakeshore Drive, it's called hospitality. Each of us has to be a survivor. Because this is a strange odyssey on which each of us has embarked, this pilgrimage to reach the epitome of a standard. Through this journey, there's a loss of many travelers. Some don't even survive the five-year limit. I won't enumerate the numerous reasons or factors why some drop out and they're not survivors, but with a few, there's a metamorphosis from the individual drawn to the collie because its reputation as a family companion and movie star to the full-blown productive breeder. Steve Fields told us a few years ago that he felt there were existing in this country approximately 10 breeders, people that he felt were producing continuity of quality and knew what they were doing. We have been aware that a few of these breeders uh, conducted their plans and results without any fanfare, without any acknowledgement, without any of uh, plaques naming them as so-and-so of the year. They outlasted trends. Now what constitutes this breeder? The most important component is an eye for a good one, a natural ability. A novice fancier can read books, subscribe to canine publications of all kinds, and attend these seminars and actually be educated beyond his ability. Cicero wrote in 43 BC, natural ability without education has more often raised a man to glory and virtue than education without natural ability. We have very few peers left today as tutors, people who have seen the great collies. In breeding, compare results with the standard and with either the few living good ones or a vivid description of the top ones in the past of 10, 15, 20 years ago or more. When we are asked how we would recognize a good one, the reply is simple, you will know. It is almost impossible to translate expression, the kind which gives you goosebumps and conveys with mere adjectives what the combination of the eye, the muzzle, ears, and skull should represent. A great teacher never tries to explain his vision. He simply invites you to stand beside him and see for yourself. You will do nothing if you wait until you can do something so well that no one can find fault. Currently, there are winners and champions which do not possess outstanding virtues. There are champions in the category of commons. Everyone talks about the quality of judging and complains, and there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. I have been appalled by some of the multiple breed judges and all-rounders. It's very evident that very little study or comprehensive understanding of the head was accomplished to have acquired the collie as an additional breed. Movement is surely a desired requisite, but not condemned when I observe some of the mountains, Siberian Huskies, Samians, Bearded Collies, Corkies, and others. The collie does not have a monopoly on poor movement or lack of showmanship. I seem to have been on a lone campaign at times, or at least in a minority, to supply judges an adjunct to our illustrated standard so that a non-breeder would better understand 
What makes the Kali head so unique? Why is it different from the Afghan or the Doberman, the Borzoi, the Smooth Fox Terrier, and some of the other herding breeds? The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. You will be made more aware of this discrepancy in wording in the portion of I on the skull study. Traveling around the country on all three panels is a, is a real education. During transportation or seated at judges' dinners, I am acutely aware, listening to conversations, that there are judges whose ego and self-acclamation truly exceeds their knowledge. There have been a few shows when George has accompanied me, and it's so nice to have someone escort me and open the door and carry my luggage. <laughs> and uh, we've attended some of the judges' dinners, and afterwards I've asked him, well, what did you think of the conversation at the dinner table? Or sometimes in the transportation of the judges from the hotel to the show site and back, to listen to these people, their comments about the, the breeds that they have, they're going to apply for, and when I show under some of these people, I want to know what their background was in their primary breed. Do, were they successful? And I don't mean like buying a dog and sending it out with a ham handler, but were they a breeder in their primary breed? Could they do something? Did they really have an eye for a dog? Or did their ego just lead them out to start applying for breed after breed after breed so they could do the group, then do the best in show, and get their picture plastered all over those two papers, what the Chronicle and, and Dog News? Well, why, why are there poor judges, inept judges, imposters? We wonder why people like Vivian Chabay does not apply for her license. Maybe she prefers to hear, like many people do, why don't you apply other than behind a person's back say, Lord, why is she applying to judge? Or why are they applying for additional breeds? Good judges do surface, and we do have good judges. And they're recognized by a marvelous, subtle grapevine. It's via the handlers, show superintendents, even the AKC reps, but they have to be a little discreet about it. And the ring stewards are an excellent barometer of a judge's capabilities. These judges are commended for integrity, credibility, ability, and their knowledge. So now to the skull. First of all, we're breeding on these skulls according to our standard. Now, let me just hold this up here. The print's pretty large. Let me see if what you, if what you people... Now, some of you know you have seen this before. I was visiting my son who lives over on the island of, of Maui, and a house guest was the uh, pilot for the corporate jet for Reynolds Tobacco Company. And he put this on a piece of paper, and he asked me if I could, uh, if I could read it. And I looked at that, and I looked. And I said, sure. It says, MR Ducks. MR Rock. Oh, SMR. CM Wings. Well, I'll be. MR Ducks. <laughs> well, he didn't know it really that we lived in Virginia and it's just that close to the North Carolina border, so we could understand that kind of language. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we really get into these skulls, I want, I, you probably wondered what this little. Uh, apparition is up here. Shelly made this for me, I don't know how many years ago, and it's easier for me to transport when I drive out to a seminar. It's very difficult to take to the, uh, uh, on, on a plane. But this is the way, years ago when we were practically flying by the seat of our pants, we didn't have too many seminars, there weren't too many books on the breed, so you had to become a, a student of a mentor, and this is how we learned. And somebody went through here, they told these people all what they knew, shared their knowledge with them. Then this person in turn shared it with this person, and this did just go on and on and on. And this is really one of the best ways to learn, is from somebody experienced. The canine species is comprised of two skeletal parts. The appendicular skeleton, which is the front and rear leg assembly, and it's the supporting framework and provides locomotion. The axial skeleton, the top line, rib cage, is connected to the cervical vertebrae, and that supports the skull. The skull consists of approximately 46 bones, most of which are fused, and the three skull types are dolichocephalic, which is the long head that's like the collie or borzoi, mesocephalic, 
the intermediate head like the setter or the beagle, and the brachycephalic, the short-headed like the bulldog or the Pekingese. It is number one, the dolichocephalic skull, which stamps our breed type, the collie. The variation of the collie skull within the breed depends on the personal interpretation of the standard and the vagaries of genetics. At birth, there is very little contrast in breed. The younger the puppy, the greater the similarity even between different breeds. A collie, bloodhound, sheltie, old English, the setters, the Belgian Tiburons, or spaniels. If you were handed a two-hour-old puppy, and forget the markings, you might find it nearly impossible to identify the breed. Very little experimental breeding for head length has been documented. Uh, Dr. Leon F. Whitney stated that one would have to be blind not to have made some useful observations. Using mostly hunting breeds, Whitney's genetic research revealed pertinent information on leg length, ear length, color, and quantity of coat. There have been bloodhound bull terrier crosses, St. Bernard and French bulldog crosses, Saluki and Basset, Chow and Boston Terrier. The head shape inheritance has been done by Wright, that's W-R-E-I-D-T, and Ilian and Markluski. They crossed uh, shepherd dogs with broad-headed hounds and found the narrow type of head to be dominant over the broad head. He found in the F2 generation, the second one down, that clear segregation occurred. They went on and on, breeding uh, short-headed dogs, narrow dogs with broad heads and all, and still did not define anything by which we can determine uh, our collie skulls. If you look in one of your handouts of the um, uh, of the old wolf, uh, and this is one that you can you can get these skulls, these copies uh, through the um, catalog I have here, Skull Duggery, out in California. And you can notice from that, and when you have an opportunity to come and walk by and see these skulls up here, that the heads really have not changed that much in thousands of years. Eddie Cantor quipped, it takes 20 years to become an overnight success. When we purchased our first show collie in 1951 and our foundation bitch in 1952, we had to literally fly by the seat of our pants. Oh, we never heard of these seminars, and the club meetings were social gatherings, but if there was a knowledgeable breeder in attendance, the conversation would be beneficial. The source of learning by mouth, because at that time the veterinary schools of medicine were interested only in the money breeds. By that I mean the uh, ca uh, beef cattle, dairy cattle, the mink breeders. There wasn't too much help from the veterinary schools of medicine. Now you'll find that they're very, very helpful to the dog breeders. Uh, individuals and dog clubs are making donations to veterinary schools of medicine and helping along the way, and now we have a better source of information. We have an abundance of seminars, some of which are sponsored by feed companies, veterinary schools of medicine, obedience and confirmation clubs, and a vast library of books on any subject from breeding to feeding to training. Individuals and clubs are giving sizable donations to these veterinary schools of medicine. This is becoming a very sophisticated hobby, but if you don't learn the basics, building on a firm foundation, the structure of your dream hobby can collapse on you. Whoever wants to reach a distant goal must take many small steps. Pogo, the old comic strip character, used to say, we have met the enemy and they is us. Us complains about judges and fellow breeders not knowing the correct or acceptable collie head and skeletal structure. Not taking advantage of the opportunity to learn is the biggest problem, our worst enemy. Education is perfecting a cultivated eye. If you have been in this hobby for a number of years, you know that your interpretation, acceptance, and tolerance has changed due to a cultivated eye for the ideal. Now look on one of your handouts and see that creature at the top that's kind of half giraffe, elephant, alligator. That's by the Washington Post cartoonist, Oliphant. And it depicts the mythical beast at the Senate door. Is this what our collie standard could be? Let's hope that we do not harbor such diverse interpretations, yet retain individuality so that our collies do not look like a baker's dozen stamped with the same cookie cutter. However, the collie standard, like many breed standards, 
is in need, I think, of some clarification, improved verbal description without violating the tradition of our original standard. The Kali head is a collection of several illusions. Now please take out your, your handout of the elephant. You've all heard of the, in Greek mythology, uh, the mythical character Cyclops. When the Greeks found a skull, and uh, they see where the, uh, there's 40 muscles that uh, work the trunk of an elephant, and these 40 muscles come together right between the two eyes. So that when the Greeks found this elephant skull, they thought they had found a skull of a creature with three eyes, so they called it Cyclops. So that's why you've got the handout of an elephant in there. Now one of the things that we'd really like to just blow your socks off with, a flat skull does not exist. Judges in their critiques talk about their dog, a flat back skull. A, a breeder will advertise his uh, male at stud, has a flat back skull, producing flat back skull. The flat back skull absolutely does not exist. I'll show you why. Let me get it. <coughs> this is the sagittal crest, right back here. Your flat back skull comes from the tissue and muscle being on either side of this uh, sagittal crest. This sagittal crest is not there at birth, and it's not there at about six to seven weeks. It's not even there on this skull, which is a puppy, uh, just about three months of age, just before they start shedding their deciduous teeth. That sagittal crest isn't coming up yet. And uh, this is where your temporal muscles are, are attached to come down to the lower mandible. This one is wired so I can use this. This one was a shellac. This bitch was buried up near Cleveland, Ohio, and through the ground and surface kind of eroding, she finally kind of surfaced. And this was the, this was the great grandmother of Champion the Air's live wire that I gave the sweepstakes win to in Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh, it was 1970 or 71. And uh, I had wanted some skulls, and so when I finished judging a, an Albright show at Cleveland, Ohio, the people invited me out to dinner, and they gave me this beautifully gift-wrapped box, and I said, oh, now you didn't have to do this. <laughs> I opened it up at the dinner table in the restaurant, and here was my first skull that I had. <laughs> but she's been a very interesting learning tool, and of course she was an aged bitch and just being uh, buried in the ground, and of course her teeth have suffered too, but it's still been a good lesson in uh, occlusion. We'll get to that a little bit later. But I think the most important thing to point out is that this is not a flat skull. And at the time of Dot's um, early death, she was doing some work on the inheritance of tissue and muscle. And uh, they still haven't come across uh, some of her papers that, that, that she was working on, and I had hoped that maybe I'd have them uh, this year. But, you know, so many times, yeah, due to um, underweight dogs, you'll find that they'll be pinched in muzzle or they'll fall off up in here. But besides nutrition, Doc felt that there was certainly uh, a facet of genetics here, which gave us our tissue and muscle over the muzzle and our tissue and muscle back here on the, on the back skull. We can see the um, evolution uh, of the of the puppies, and when you come up here to look, this one head down here is Champion Socrates of Gerstown. And Murray told me, he was telling me that there is a nice picture in the color review out there, and this is Sock with his um, photo on the cover of the CCFA Bulletin, and the skull right above the magazine is Sock. I mentioned to you that I felt, without violating our standard, that perhaps like lightning and the lightning bug, we could have just a little bit better word to describe the, the eye of the collie. The almond derives its eye from the Hebrew word shakad, which means awakening. 
opening, rising, realizing. Yet the Sharpay standard, described in almond eye as extremely small, the almond is mentioned no less than 73 times in the Old Testament. Of 125 breeds of dogs, 31 standards request an almond eye. There are many varieties of almonds, about 50, including the Barbary and the Jordanian. One of the best all-purpose almonds is the nonpareil, developed during the gold rush days. Now, is it the all-purpose, nonpareil variety that standard authors were envisioning when this descriptive phrase was used to describe the eye of the Irish setter, the Afghan, German Shepherd, Scottish Terrier, Pomeranian even, the Siberian Husky, the Sinji, Commodore, and Rottweiler? The latter states, medium-sized, almond-shaped. Then we see that some breeds describing an almond eye want it to be moderate size. that's the chow. Ribs should be almond-shaped, that's the Anatolian Shepherd. A number of breeds describe slightly almond-shaped, that's the Belgian Sheepdog and the Malinois and the Taburin. And the additional adjectives of obliquely and slanted can be added to our confusion. The Akita standard wants a triangular eye. Factors which contribute to the collie skull and other breed variations include the curvature of the zygomatic arch. I'll take this white head up here so you can see. This is the zygomatic arch of the malar bone, right here, right on the side. Can you all see? Right here on the side. This arch is located just above the zygomatic process of the malar bone which influence eye placement. The bone is flat and elongated, and when you run your hands over the area of a living dog with all the tissue and muscle and hair, you might you mention, wow, oh, this dog is smooth and cheek. And the frontal crest and the frontal bone, which are the navel bones here, decide whether or not the stop will influence the type of head. Now, something I would like to interject here, when you look at these skulls, you'll see uh, that uh, this bone right here in, in this skull, which is an older dog, is fused. Uh, we were very interested to learn, and, and we've learned this because of Dot's work with these skulls. This bone doesn't fuse until the collie is about six or seven years of age. And, you know, you, so many times you've seen dogs that finish their championships by the time they're 11 months old. They're clean, they look back good back here. Then you never see them again. They're not brought out in competition. Part of it is because the head is flared. It's gone out with almost kind of a common look. And uh, years ago, I suppose you, you think that George uh, and Barbara and I and some of the others keep reminiscing and perhaps a little bit too much nostalgia about the good old days. But I can remember uh, the Ed Pickhart uh, talking about, someone asked him, when was the best time to pick out a good collie? And he said, when you're about three years old. And years ago, we weren't this concerned with sweepstakes and taking out young puppies. People sat on their dogs and brought them out when they thought they were ready. And there just wasn't this, you just didn't see puppies that much. But now, perhaps we have a, a reason and we can understand it better why, when we realize that this bone doesn't even fuse until the collie is about six or seven years of age. And you can see this in the skulls up here from um, dogs at six to seven years of age. There's a skull here of a Roman-headed collie, and on down the line, and then to Sock's head, and this, this was an older one too, where that bone is fused. You can have weight loss, lack of condition, it will certainly affect your back skull. And another thing, Laverne Walker said never again would she talk about ears being on the corner of the skull because there isn't any corner. This all comes down like this. The ears are up here on, on, on tissue and muscle, and it's the muscles that control uh, so much of the ear set on the back skull of a collie. The sagittal crest is there for a reason. Nature does not usually produce something without a purpose. As I told you, the crest is the attachment point for pow the powerful temporal muscles that power the lower jaw or the mandible. Skulls from the prehistoric age to more contemporary times show the evolution of hominis, the human-like species, 
of which humans are the sole surviving branch of a more luxuriant evolutionary tree. And you may look through my catalog up here for skull duggery and see the um, uh, uh, the human skulls that they have available. They even tell you you get a discount if you buy the whole family, male, female, child skull. But um, I did give you a handout there of the uh, eight, uh, where you can see uh, the difference in the um, uh, frontal skull across the ridge of the of the uh, eyes. If you study the primate skulls, and I gave you the handout on that, particularly gorillas or skulls of other breeds with various jaw and snout formations, you will notice the difference in the sagittal crest. You will be acutely aware of the difference between species which feed on tough grasses and nuts and the more refined, small-toothed relations which have a diet of fruits and meat. Now this is a cow's skull down here. And you notice she doesn't have uh, any sagittal crest. And this is because they don't chew anything up and down like this. And they have a couple stomachs. And they eat some grass or hay. Then they regurgitate this and they just kind of mash it back and forth and then swallow it again. They don't need these powerful temporal muscles to come down to chew anything hard. So there you are, a cow skull, no sagittal crest. Get down to the teeth and a little bit about occlusion. The deciduous teeth in a puppy like this, this is about uh, a three month old collie puppy. And by the way, these two heads up here are Shetland sheep dogs. You notice how uh, similar the skull is on the two shelves when you come by. And you're more than welcome to come up and look. Just don't handle them because they are very, very fragile. But the baby puppy has 28 deciduous teeth. The permanent teeth are 42, and there's 20 in the upper, 22 in the lower. The natural occlusal pattern in a collie is referred to as a scissors bite. The maxillary or upper incisors overlap the mandibular or the lower incisors. Now, something that's been very interesting, and I think Mrs. Long was one of the first to put this in print and bring it to people's attention, was the matter of the inverted carnasial lower, which is right back here. And uh, some years ago, uh, when we were showing at, at, a, uh, at a show, uh, one of the exhibitors was told that her young dog had an inverted carnasial lower bite, and it was suggested the exhibitor discard the dog and not breed in that family line at all because this is going to become quite a problem. And uh, so the exhibitor was talking to me about it and I thought, well, I don't really, I don't know what it could really do, but I thought that was a rather strange um, bit of advice because the dog that this judge eventually put best to breed also had an inverted carnesial lower bite. And you, you find it uh, all across the country. Sometimes I'll find it um, more often um, in some locations than I do others. And so for the past 15 years, I've been on my own little uh, education jaunt here to find out as much as I could about this carnesial motor back here. I think some of it is due to the fact that the people, the breeders, are so intent upon watching this uh, scissors bite up here with these central teeth right up in here, they never look back here, never. And I know that a lot of the people in their grooming never clean their dog's teeth. So I kept watching and looking for these inverted carnesial molar bites. And I found that sometimes before I ever put, my, ever put my hand on these dogs to go over them and lift this back up here and look, I could tell that that's exactly what I was going to find because this fell off right here. This did not come around here at all. Many times when I found an inverted molar bite back here, and this was a nice round finish over here, I felt perhaps this was due to the fact that people really didn't remove those deciduous teeth. And many times when I looked in our own dog's mouth after that, here came the permanent tooth back in here on the inside of the deciduous tooth before this tooth ever came out. 
So I really think that the breeders ought to be a little bit more cautious about watching those back teeth back there. And um, when you see a dog that falls off under the eye here, doesn't have this bony protrusion, I feel that sometimes that is a genetic problem. It is inherited. But then when you see this nice round muzzle up here and you run into it, look back and think and wonder if you're the owner of that dog or had it through its um, adolescent stage, but perhaps you just didn't look back there and get those teeth out. The perfect collie is never going to be produced. We may minimize our breed problem and even completely eradicate some by prudent breeding and use of genetics. A particular problem is not unique to you or your collie. Now please read the penis comic strip. Right below the uh, standard up here, she said, I missed school yesterday because I had a cold. Oh, there must be something going around. Lots of kids have been getting cold. Mine was a lot worse, though. Why? Because it happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> Some breeders or individuals are very apprehensive to admit they've had skeletons in their closet. You can't blow the dust away without making someone cough. According to the ancient religious traditions on the Day of Judgment, all secrets will be revealed and all hidden sins bared. The Day of Judgment has arrived for some individuals who have not wanted to accept facts. Constant denial, then admission, is embarrassing. Nothing is as hard to do gracefully as getting down off your high horse. Now let me just go over some of these skulls and then we'll we can break for lunch. Ah, well here's Socrates. Very, very nice eye. We saw him at the same time um, that Rizalon was being shown down at the Birmingham, uh, Birmingham Alabama specialty. And um, Breezy was there with his owner at the time, Barbara of Woodmansey, and Doc Girth had Socrates there. And the night before, this was when you were allowed to have a dinner and socialize with the judge, and the night before, Steve Fields was judging, and uh, they had a question and answer period, and uh, a young fellow raised his hand, and he said, uh, Mr. Fields, uh, will you uh, explain something about the collie stop? Steve sat there and he chewed on his cigar for a while and he said, Wow, wished you hadn't asked that. <laughs> Mrs. Christie said it was merely a brow. So uh, several years ago I was judging and speaking out in California and um, I was having a late evening conversation with Helga Kane and Alice Horton and we got to talking about the stuff. I had the, just the one poly skull with me, the old one, and we were talking about it. And, and the three of us just didn't um, didn't agree on this stop business. So I got home and I thought, who's the person to talk to? Steve Fields. So I called him. And he seemed to be so pleased to, to talk to someone about colleagues over the telephone. And I asked him, since I wasn't taping our conversation, if you mind if I took notes. He said, not at all. And I said, do you remember that special you did down in Birmingham, Alabama, and someone asked you what the stop was, and he said, yeah. I said, Mrs. Christie said it was merely a brow, and Florence Cummings said that too. Now, Steve Fields never said, I said that. He quoted Florence Cummings, Mrs. Christie. And then we talked about the difference of the stop and the Cocker Spaniel and the Pomeranian and some of these other, other breeds. But... One of our lessons, when we lived in the Des Moines, uh, Iowa area, and we had an opportunity to uh, be active in the Collie Club of Nebraska, and many of the meetings were held at Steve Fields Parade or Kennels, one of our lessons we had one day was to bring in some collies, and everyone closed their eyes and went over the collie head. As you came up like that, all you really felt were these eyebrows up here. There wasn't anything up here that protruded. When any bones or anything, as you came up, all you felt was the brow. So I, I typed off a couple of copies of my conversation, mailed one to Helga and one to Alice, and we got back and forth in our conversations and our letter writing about the collie stop. And there again, I thought, when I first started out in the dogs years ago, that um, 
it would be like the stair steps coming up here. You had an abrupt stop, and there you'd have a bowler coming up here like a cement block, and then there'd be a step up and another cement block, and that's the way it was. But this is your frontal bone, your nasal bones. You see in some of these dogs over here that have very poor stops, um, how the uh, frontal bone and the nasal bone comes clear up. Now look at this one. This is the Roman head. <laughs> You can see what a curvature is to that. And then look down and see the suture lines in, in, in the muzzle. And here's another poor head. This was a young bitch. And you can see she's young because that, uh, those malar bones weren't even fused. I think she was about four, four years old. But then look at the um, frontal bone. In the, in the sutures in the nasal bone. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put him back down here with this picture. <laughs> now there are two skulls down here. One is of a puppy one day old one at three days old, and they're extremely fragile. Uh, and so if you just want to look at that, you know, look and don't touch. The next one is Sock. Then you can see these other dogs up here. Now, and if uh, we've got some time, how are we doing on time? We'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to explain to you what some of these things are on these heads and what you can look for. Let's see, I was trying to figure out if there was anything that I overlooked. I don't think so. Are there any questions? Yes, Mrs. Schwartz. Sorry, on a dog that has a pronounced stop, say as a great thing or um, just fox or some of the other breeds. Uh, well, I was going to say great, great thing because they don't have the, the other breed, mm -hmm. the other dog. What does it look like? Well, since I haven't seen a great thing skull, but um, we were down at the Veterinary School of Medicine in Virginia. Uh, our, our Aubrey Kennel Club gives scholarships to three veterinary students. And uh, they're very thankful to get this money. And also they take you through the Veterinary School of Medicine. And what really fascinated me was the incomplete skeleton of a hog. And you know, they've got quite a stop just up like that. And so what it is, it's, it's just bent. It just, it just bent, just like that. And there again, it doesn't seem to be an abrupt. I have been promised a Weimaraner skull, uh, which has quite a, a deep stop. But still, uh, our house dog is a Great Dane. I remember George had a, a Great Dane, and this is our second Dane. She's just our house dog and our pet. But I watch her very closely and how animated she is with these eyebrows. And you just watch them. And when she pulls her ears up, the eyebrows, come up when she gets excited or interested interested in something or hears noises. And there again, once your colleague, these the eyebrows up here are ab, actually exclamation points. And then, we, then when the dog doesn't want to show and they lay their ears back and they're lazy, they're lazy watch those eyebrows flatten out. It's all, all muscle. Are there any other questions or anything? Mr. Horn. Mr. Horn is my father. I'm yours. Yes, okay. <laughs> Now this dog isn't groomed in a sophisticated manner like you see a lot of the people now, but um, I, I judged the day after DCFA in Rochester some years ago, and um, a, a dog was brought into the ring under me, and I didn't recognize the girl at the lead end or all, and I looked at this dog, and I thought, what a head, what an expression, this is gorgeous. And then I kind of raised up and I thought, oh, please, God, I hope he can move. <laughs> and I said to the girl, take the dog on a triangle and came back and um, gave him with his dog. And Dot Girth was there on the sideline and she was going to leave on a flight, uh, I believe it was Ohio, to visit her grandchildren. And she came up and she said to me, Bobby, I watched your hands and your face when you were going over that dog. He is lovely. And I, to me, that is, uh, because I do have that picture, that photo available, there are other dogs too, but I think this dog is a fine example of this beautiful, nice, round, smooth muzzle.
and then that eye placement, it just gives you goosebumps when you see it. It really, we talk about the great dog and the good dog, and they all have fall. Uh, but uh, when you see a headpiece like that with the muzzle and the underjaw and the finish, I used these uh, pictures from Mary Cummer. She gave me uh, permission to, to use these. I mean, we can't sell them or anything like this. But look at the tricolor head and look at that nice muzzle and finish and how nice and, and round it is. Um, then the um, sable, the profile view. You. you know, so many people talk about the eye being a triangular shape. I know Gus Secrets uh, talked about this quite a bit and on through some of his students like Ann Cross. Um, to give it a triangular shape is the tissue and muscle coming up over the frontal bone and around up towards the eyebrow. But if you're working with an artist and you don't put those eyebrows in there and some of those little lines, it's the, the almond shaped, as the AKC book will tell you, it's the shape of the eye rims. Then if you draw a line from the outer edge up, you'll find that generally it comes right to the base of the ear. That's a nice placement for an eye. Let's hear from Bobby.